Well, I, we're finishing up our series, but uh, just as we do that, I want to uh, encourage and welcome anybody who would like to uh, join us for permitting. Just a, just a note that this is, this is a place, if you want to grow, you're going to be challenged a bit, so you, you'll want to grow if you come to our prayer meeting. You'll learn to pray, either silently or out loud. Both people do both. But it's a place where you're, you will be taken to a new level and learn to pray at a new level. So if that's something that's growing in your heart and you sense you want to grow closer to God, that's the place, uh, a place to come because uh, it will take you where you haven't been before. Um, second thing, um, this series uh, ends today, the series that I'm in, and we're moving into uh, a series called Identity. It's like most people, if they know the name Jesus, uh, other than a curse word, as Cindy shared with us, uh, they know him as a baby in a manger, and, uh, but Jesus is much more than a baby in a manger, and we're going to explore his identity and how when meeting him authentically, it transforms our lives and areas of our lives, our sex lives, our money lives, our, our emotional lives, the way we treat others, attitudes that we, we have, forgiveness that we struggle with. These things are transformed by the person of Jesus Christ because of who he is. And so we're going to explore his identity in the next several weeks over Christmas. Who was it that was really in that manger? But for now, we're going to finish the Me For We, uh, the series, that brief series that we've been doing. Uh, we believe that God is leading us as a church over the next six, seven years to double our impact and to complete the building that we are in that was started almost 15 years ago. And uh, we, we are stepping out in faith. It's a big, big step for us. It's going to force us to become different people, a different church. Uh, helping us to care for those who, who do not know Jesus Christ, reaching out to them and completing the work and the assignment which God gave this church uh, starting 40 years ago. And so uh, we, we have been uh, bringing this to the church and the body. If you're new here, that's why we're talking about it. We believe it's our vision from God for us as we move forward into the future. And so whenever somebody tells you vision, the first question I always ask if I'm not part of that is, well, what do you expect of me? What, what's my part? And so this series was about how do I join with God, not how do you join necessarily with Pastor Ed, because uh, I'm just one of the leaders here, and uh, how do I join with God and what he wants to do at Springville. And we've framed it around three questions. I think these three questions get the essence of where God is leading us over the next six or seven years, and that's who will I reach? And so I spent time talking about that, how we, God is calling us to be a voice, a, a presence, loving people and in their lives so they, they might know and see, and, and then inviting them to meet Christ, inviting them here, inviting them to uh, conversations, inviting them to reading the scriptures, inviting them to understand and, and experience or discover who Christ is. And then we talked about how will we pray. We believe the foundation of this church, of any church, is God. And we, we access and build on that foundation through our prayer. And you, you get to hear the final sermon, which is, what will I give? What will I give? Now, uh, Thinking of baptism and giving, I had to have a, a link, and I came across a story, uh, which I, I, I'll tell you this story. So uh, in the medieval church, so we're talking centuries ago, uh, Europe was a pretty wild place, and uh, there wasn't a lot of law, uh, and so different areas would have uh, bands or standing armies that would protect them. And the churches were no different. The churches would hire mercenaries to protect their land and protect their people and sometimes to fight battles that would, where brigands or armies or smaller groups of armies would come and try to take over and rob. And so they would hire mercenaries. And, and some of the mercenaries that were for hire were tribes, were the, the wild tribes, the, the unchristian tribes that were around them. And they would hire their mercenary, uh, them as mercenaries because they were such good fighters. But in order to make it all legit with the church, they would baptize 
those uh, mercenaries, so then, you know, everything is copacetic. We got them baptized, they belong to the church, and that was their thinking. And so they, as they hired mercenaries, <laughs> they would baptize them. Of course, the priests and even the mercenaries understood that Jesus said, don't kill. And that posed a bit of a problem when you were hiring an army to fight battles against other people. And so they would baptize them, but the mercenaries would hold their sword uh, up in the air. So when they baptized them, the sword never went in the water. So it was, they were okay to do whatever they needed to with the sword. They could kill people, but the rest of them was sanctified for God. And so that's how they got around that sticky situation. You know, we can look back on that and think, well, that was so stupid and treat, look at the church leaders with disdain. And yet we, we better be careful because Sometimes I think when we were baptized, we didn't hold a sword above the water, but we hold our wallets and our purses out of the water. That's an area God has no influence or right to talk to me about. I'll do what I want with my purse or my money or my wallet, but the rest of me will belong to God. Now, if you're sitting here and uh, you don't go to church much, or uh, you, you're welcome, I'm, we're glad you're here, but I, I'm just trying to think of, if you're a visitor, even if you come to this church, you're thinking, oh, the church talking about money again? I mean, what is this? They took two offerings. Man, these guys are hung up on money. <clears throat> it just, can you talk about something else? Why is the church always talking about money? Well, actually, the truth is, if you came here 52 weeks a year, you would discover we don't really talk about money that much. Uh, in fact, I think we should talk about it more for the very simple reason that money, in Jesus' mind, money was the number one thing that drew people to hell and st stagnates them in their journey and walk with God. Money. And so not talking about money as a church is like a parent of a teenager not talking about sex as their teen goes into a sexually charged environment and has to make decisions that are life impacting and withholding that talk from the teen. Seems kind of dumb, doesn't it? And so for us not to talk about the one thing that draws people's hearts away from God the most would be irresponsible. I think I should talk about it more. Now, the reason I say that is uh, 1 Corinthians, or 1 Timothy rather, 1 Timothy 6. This is what Paul wrote Godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and we can take what? Nothing out of it. Which is true, really. You think about it, you come into the world naked, and you leave it pretty well that way. But if we have food and clothing, we will learn to be content with that. Now, watch this. Those who want. Now, the, th this is the desire. It's not, he's not saying those who have. Those who set their focus in their heart on becoming rich fall into a temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. We follow our hearts. And so when our hearts focus on money, it puts us into dangerous situations that can cause deep pain in our life and often it's over a long period of time before we realize what we have done to ourselves. Because we've sold ourselves for the pursuit of money. Which, by the way, is a temporal thing. And we are eternal beings. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Money is not the root of evil. The love of money causes all kinds of evil in our thinking in our words, in our actions. And Paul goes on to say, some people eager for money have wandered from the faith. They've wandered away from Jesus and have pierced themselves with many griefs. That's why we talk about money. Because of its impact on us. And all of us has to deal with it. Just like all of our teens have to deal with with the issue of sex. Well, in fact, all of us have to deal with that issue in a very sexualized culture. So I want to talk about that final question. If we're going to engage in the vision that we have, one of the questions we're going to have to ask ourselves is what will I give? 
Before I talk about what we give, which really wouldn't take me that much time, Dave, I could have ended really right now, uh, I want to talk to you about first why. Why would you give? And uh, I don't think we understand that scripture says there are very good reasons for us to give. And so 2 Corinthians chapter 9, I want to just read a couple of verses from here. Is Paul's teaching the church, even in the first century, the very first church, Paul, one of the leaders of the church, was teaching them the value of giving and being generous. So I want us to learn from the scriptures and from their uh, experience why giving is worth doing. I mean, if you're going to do it, we, have, we should know what value it has. Remember this, Paul writes, whoever sows sparingly will also reap what? Right. And whoever uh, sows generously will reap what? Generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctant or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. God doesn't love, take it. He loves, go ahead, have it. Two reasons in those two verses why it's wise to give. One, it produces a reward in your life and in eternity. And two, it will bring you joy you won't experience any other way. We can talk about those just for a second. <coughs> If a farmer sows, has a field, and sows just a little bit of seed, what kind of harvest should he expect? Well, a small one. But if a farmer has a field and sows a lot of seed in it, what kind of harvest should he expect? A large one. Sowing with our money is a, an act of of eternal generosity. And what do I mean by this? This is the words of Jesus. When he's, by the way, the Bible talks about money all over, so you, you'll, you can find all kinds of different verses. It's, it's very good in teaching us on this area. But Matthew chapter 6, let's see Matthew 6. Jesus speaking. Do not, now this is the, the advice of Jesus to those of us who live in this world. Don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth. Why? Because moth and rust destroy them and thieves break in and steal. In other words, it's just a poetic way of saying that the, 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 the riches that we have here, they end. They, they don't go with us into eternity. When we pass from here, they, they don't follow us. They, they, they don't even last our whole time here. They, they, they can get consumed and lost and used up. Instead, store up for yourself treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break and steal. So instead, use the financial resources you have here to in invest in heaven. To invest in heaven. To invest in eternity. Instead of spending your money on thieves, things that will be used up in our temporary. Instead, use some of it to invest in things that are eternal and bring a reward. And as you sow generously, you reap generously, but if you sow sparingly, you reap sparingly. Now, let's just time out. Okay, I'm going to call a coach's time out right now. I'm just going to leave the sermon over here for a second, and uh, we're going to go in a time out. So let's huddle up and talk for just a minute. Now, these are words that are written to uh, followers of Jesus. So if you're not a follower of Jesus, there's no compulsion to anything I'm saying here for you. I believe it is the best way to handle our money, but it is not required of you if you're a follower of Jesus. If you're not a follower of Jesus, rather. Now, you will be held accountable for how you use your money, so it's wise to follow the principles of Jesus since he's the judge. But if you're not a follower of Jesus, then I get it. You, you're sitting here in church, you maybe came because somebody invited you, and, and you're sitting going, oh no, he's talking about money. You're free. You don't have to listen to this. But if you are a follower of Jesus, this is not optional. Sometimes I think we forget what following Jesus means. Following Jesus is not like a friendship with a friend where you can expose part of your life to them and hold others back. 
not many friendships where you know you share with them everything in your bank account and you talk about everything openly and they have access to every part of your life. The deeper the friend, of course, the more access, but there's always a sense which there's boundaries. Following Jesus is not like having a friend. It's like being married, where you enter into a marriage and everything is open, everything is shared, everything has access by two different people. In fact, it's even a little bit more intimate than that because when we follow Jesus, what we are saying is that we are surrendering ourselves to him. And he now is the Lord, the, the co more common word for that today would be master of our lives. We are submitting ourselves to him to live our life as he directs according to his principles because we believe that he really truly loves us. And like a good father or a good mother, when he shares with us his teaching, it's for our good, even if we don't understand it or don't even believe it at the time. But we trust that he is good and he is compassionate, and so we surrender to his teaching. And when I talk about uh, following Jesus, I'm talking about this. Jesus uh, came, uh, he's God. He's the second member of the Trinity. And he left heaven 2,000 years ago and came to be a baby, born as a baby, born into a human body. And then he grew to be a man and then he went to a cross to die, but not because he deserved the death, but because we did. And he took our place on the cross, and because he's God and infinite, he was able to take the sins of all mankind and suffer the punishment and the result or the consequences of our sin. And he rose three days later. This is the teaching of Scripture. He rose three days later, and he said, Now, for anyone who wants to be reconciled with God, you heard the stories of those three people. How they each came in different paths, but they all came to Jesus. And through him received the forgiveness of sins and eternal life. When they put their faith in him, when they surrendered their lives to him, when they chose to follow him. We use different terms to describe it, but in its essence, it's the surrendering of your life. And believing that his death and his resurrection pays for your sins, reconciles you to God, and then surrendering yourself. I believe. I'm yours. So if you haven't made that decision, that is the starting point of a walk with Jesus, of the forgiveness of sins with God, and of eternity being placed in your heart. Because God comes, when we put our faith in him, he comes within us, puts his own spirit within us to change us from the inside out. And one of the areas that he works is this area, our money. Because he doesn't want us to wander from him or from heaven. And he wants us to benefit and live full lives that will be full, not necessarily the way we view life here, but when we stand in eternity and look back and go, wow, I never realized that generosity shaped me so much and prepared an eternity, a harvest an eternity for me. And so he tells us that ahead of time. Those that sow sparingly, reap sparingly. And those that sow generously, reap generously. And that is one good reason to give. Another good reason to give is he says here in this next verse, each of you should decide, or each of you should give what you decide in your heart to give, not reluctantly, not like, oh, I have to give. So if you feel pressure to give, then stop giving. Because God's looking for you to give from your heart. Now, when, when he says here, uh, decide what to give in your heart. He doesn't mean, well, whatever I feel like, I'll give today. That's not the, imp the, the intent of those verses. That's not what Paul's saying. Paul is saying, you need to sit down and you need to go through scriptures. You need to pray and seek God, talk to other people that understand this, and then make a decision about what you believe God is calling you to give. And then be faithful and persistent in that giving. Because this is a transaction between not you and me, not even you and Springvale, though this is a place, if you come here, you should be given to, but between you and God. Because it's a heart issue. And Paul says, you need to sit down with God and work through this, wrestle it down, and decide what God is calling you to give, and then be faithful in doing it. And then, 
you will experience what Jesus, is a paradox of giving. In Acts chapter 20, verse 35, Paul says again, he's writing, I did everything, and everything I did, I showed you that by this kind of hard work, we must help the weak, remembering the words of Jesus himself, it's more blessed to give than receive. You'll get more joy from giving than receiving, says Jesus, and that will sound crazy to you until you take Jesus at his word and start to give, and then you begin to experience a joy you will never experience through any other thing. Uh, this... Um, about two weeks ago, I was sitting in a donor event for Trinity Western University. <clears throat> I'm a donor with them, and so I went to this event. And so they were, they were just sharing their plans, where they're going in the future, and then sharing with us uh, some, uh, they wanted us to hear the impact that it's having on the lives of some particular people. And there was a young girl from the Hamilton area that got up. She had just, well, she was a woman, she had just graduated from her bachelor, under degree and she was sharing with us her story. She moved to, they emigrated, her and her family emigrated to Canada when she was sick, six, and uh, because of the abuse and the viciousness of the father against the family, they went into a shelter, and for the next several years, they moved about from shelter to shelter, the mom, and I think it was three or four kids, and moved from shelter to shelter so they couldn't be found by the father. He told them, if I find you, I'll kill you. Eventually, they found a place where he didn't know where they were at, and they, she, they were getting to put down roots. And then somebody from her high school invited her to a youth group where she put her faith in Jesus Christ. She had not been taught. She came from a Muslim background. She had not been taught that Jesus was the Savior of the world. And so she realized who Jesus was, and she took that step that I talked about just a few minutes ago. She trusted Jesus for the salvation of her sins. In her grade 12 year, she uh, wanted to go to university and her marks, she was incredibly smart and her marks were off the charts. And uh, she wanted to go to Trinity Western University but could not afford it. Her family was barely surviving. And so her teachers were saying, you should apply to Queens or U of T, you'll get in, you'll get scholarships. But a recruiter from TWU, whom she'd been talking to and sharing her heart with, said, let me see what I can do. And so she, she arranged for the, uh, this girl to come out and see the school, and they found a job for her, and then they accessed some of the scholarships. And she was receiving help because of her high marks and the scholarship and her hard work for four years. She worked hard and received scholarships to be able to get her undergrad degree, and she was describing how she was now going into medicine, and she had a vision from God for her life to care for women who are abused, women and children who are abused. <laughs> from her own life experience, and God had touched her heart. And she, she, she was reading it, and she looked up at all of us that were sitting there, and she said to us, it is because of your generosity that I was able to go to this school and hear God's vision for my life, and I cannot thank you enough. And I was sitting in the crowd, and I'm a donor to that, uh, that scholarship fund, and do you know what I was thinking? Every dollar was worth what I gave. I, was, I had a, a joy that I could have been part of touching this woman's life because of how God had blessed me and I was able to give. There's nothing like the joy that comes with generosity. So that's why Paul says, hey, you know why you give? You give because it creates a harvest in eternity for you. And you give because it gives you a joy as you walk with Jesus and live like he did. So let's think about this. Well, why don't we give? Well, we don't give because we're fearful, I think. I'm afraid. I'm afraid. Well, what if a crisis comes? And, and how will I meet my bills? And how am I going to find that extra money to give? And where is it going to come from? What, what about my kids? I won't be able to take them on a trip. I won't be able to help them with school. I won't be able to help them with their wedding. And, and then we start fearful about, about, about what could come into our lives. And we're afraid of, of, of not having enough if we give. Because we're living so tight as it is. Or we're just selfish, like... No, I, I, I want what I want. I would rather honor myself than God. And so these things that I want in my life, not the things I need, the things that I want, they're more important than obeying God. 
And I think Paul was, was kind of thinking of that when he uh, wrote the next verses. He said, God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. What did he just say? He just said, God is able to give you whatever you need so that when you face a need, he will provide for you. When you are generous. Remember, that's the context here. As you give generously, God will take care of you. Whenever you have a need, he will ensure that that need is met. As it is written, they have freely scattered their gifts to the poor, their righteousness endures forever. It's a quote from the Old Testament, meaning as people were generously giving, others saw in them God. Their righteousness was revealed in their generosity. Their love for God was revealed as they gave gifts to the poor. Now, he, meaning God, who supplies seed to the sower and bread for all the food, will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest in your righteousness. He's pulling from that metaphor that he used, right? You sow sparingly, you reap sparingly. Well, the God who, you know, in the metaphor, the farmer goes out and sows. Well, as you go out and sow the, with generosity the financial seed that you have in your life, God, the one who provides it, will keep providing it for you. Not only that, he will increase your store of seed. He will even give you more and enlarge the harvest of your righteousness, picking up on that quote from the Old Testament. As you obey him and give, and God says, oh, okay, that person is faithful with what I give them. I'll give them more so they can give it. Not so you can live on it and increase your wants, but so that you can increase the, the opportunity to give and you can increase the harvest that God wants for your life and that which is eternally good. This is how God works. As you are faithful with what he gives you, he goes, hmm, I can trust that person. I'll increase them more. You'll be enriched in every way. Why? So that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. This is how God works. As you are generous, he goes, hmm, I can trust that person. I'll give them a little bit more. Last uh, summer, no, two summers ago, uh, I traveled with Richard McGowan. He's the um, director of Emmanuel International. They do relief work all over the world, and he's the Canadian director. <coughs> so Richard and I went to Africa, and then on our return, we stopped in London, and his wife Pam and my wife Crystal joined us in London. So the four of us were there. And they were born in England, so they became our tour guide for a week. If you ever get the chance to travel with Richard, take it. <laughs> it was the best trip with him and Pam. I have never laughed so much or talked about such great things. It was like we were laughing our guts out or we were deeply talking about important, life-changing things. Like we were, we were all over the map and, and they took us ever. I don't know where half the places we went, but they took us and it was the best holiday. And even in Africa with Richard, it was the most enlightening trip I've ever So you can go with EI on their short-term mission trips. I highly recommend any short-term mission trip, but really recommend it with Richard. Although there are other good ones that are out there. So we were uh, headed to Bletchley Park. You may be familiar with Bletchley Park. That's where they cracked the code for Enigma. It's the imitation game was the, the movie with um, uh, Cumberbatch. And uh, that's, that mansion was called Bletchley Park. And so we were driving there in the car. And Richard turned to me and uh, said to me, I guess he turned to me because he's driving in England, so he's on this side, not on this side. So he turned to me and he said, we were talking about the vision for the church. It was just fresh and just coming out. And he said, well, okay, you're, you're talking about finishing the building and, and, and reaching out to them. What, what do you think would be a cost? I said, I have no idea what the cost would be, but I got to think it's going to be north of four or five million. 
And I said, but I don't really know. We, we haven't priced it out. We'll, we'll know that when we, we move forward through, but I, it's not going to be cheap. And he said to me, he, he looked in the rearview mirror and said to Pam, we can give 1% to that. And Pam goes, yeah, I don't see why not. In 15 seconds, they had made a commitment for forty to $50,000. 15 seconds. That would have taken me a little longer than 15 seconds. Now here's why this, I'm telling you this story. Richard makes a dollar a year. I think he's overpaid personally, but uh, <laughs> he went to EI when they were suffering financially and uh, God had taken care of them through their life and he said, I'll come to work for a dollar a year. Now, their income combined, Pam and his income, they give away more money each year than they make. Well, that's a quick trip into bankruptcy. But not with them. See, as I was, like I knew the background of the storm, I'm like, how are you going to commit to that kind of money? And if you are around Richard and Pam for very long, you will see they have a deep love for giving. They get a kick out of giving. And they have done it for so long and God has been so faithful that now they actually give away more than they make. I don't know how they do it. Well, yes, they do, because he'll tell you how he does it. They do it because he goes, we know God is going to bless us and give us income from where, and money from where we don't even know where it's coming from. So we just make commitments, and then God gives us the money, and we give to the commitments. And so we know that if that's what the church is calling us to do and be a part of that, we're going to make this commitment. And even though I don't even have the money, I know God will provide it, and we'll just give it when it comes in. You will be enriched, this is what the Word of God says, you'll be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. Through us, and through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. There's a whole world here that when we have the faith to enter, we experience God's presence and his provision in a way it's really almost unbelievable. God is saying, trust me with this. Figure out what it is you need to give. Sit down with the scriptures. Pray, ask other people what scriptures apply to this and settle with yourself or you and your spouse, settle before God what it is you think he would have you give and then be faithful in doing it and then watch God work in your life. When you go through scriptures, you'll find three types of giving. In the Old Testament, you'll find the tithe and offering. The tithe was just simply 10%. That was the required amount a follower of God would give 10%. They'd take their income, take 10% and give it to God. Then you'll find offerings. Offerings were the heart gift. It, they could be anything. There was just whatever a person's heart wanted to give over and atop of their regular giving. And then in the New Testament, you'll find a thing called grace giving. And grace giving is to follow Jesus. As Jesus gave more than what was required from the law, he gave fully of himself, gave over and above the law. As grace is greater than the law, so grace giving is giving more than what is required. There are the three types of basic giving you'll find in the scriptures. What is God calling you to? Or maybe, <laughs> what, are you, what have you settled with God where you're going with this? This is about a relationship with God and taking what is very important to us and what shapes our life and trusting him with it and so thereby growing in your love and your experience of God. The danger is when we don't give, our hearts wander, as Paul said, our hearts wander away from God. It's potential when we focus our hearts on what we can get now and use for ourselves is we wander away from God and wander from eternity. Dave was up here, I'll just end with this, Dave was up here talking about a uh, Christmas offering. If you want an opportunity to begin to say, God, I'm going to give, would you consider our Christmas offering? 
Consider as we move in to follow the vision, ask that question, what can I give? And ask God, God, what do you want us to give? What do you want me to give here? And then trust for his provision to be generous. It will grow your heart for God in a way that few other things do. But it does take faith. Would you bow your head with me? Jesus, I know that this topic can be offensive to some people. I know that it can cause us to struggle. Uh, it cuts into our everyday working. And so as uh, we just bow our heads before you, I want to thank you for your grace to us. I want to thank you for your generosity to us, your provision for us, how we have received we didn't even choose to be born into this country, but we were, and we've had opportunity, and we had blessing, and we had governments to provide for our, our needs, and, and because, of, because of faithfulness and adherence to principles of generosity. And so I ask that you would begin to talk to us. If, if there are some not giving here, that they would begin to say, well, maybe this is something I need to really think about and start giving. And some that are giving infrequently, that they'd say, maybe this is something I need to improve on. And those that are, are giving, but may be asking, God, what is it you're calling me to greater than what I'm giving? And my faith needs to grow, and I'm going to trust you as we go forward. So God, would you begin to work in our hearts and help us to learn the joy that comes, because it's more blessed to give than receive. I pray that if anybody was offended by this uh, uh, sermon, that God, you would help them to seek you, not listen to my words, but seek you in your word to see if this is a message that you have for them. And help us not to shrink back from the truth, but to engage and embrace it. In your name I pray, amen.